So will Biden go through with attempts to re-enter the JCPOA nuclear deal with Iran? And if so, what might that even look like? Joining us to discuss is columnist for Newsweek and the editor of HistoryCentral.com, Mark Schulman, and the Council for Republicans Overseas Israel, Abe Katzman. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Now, Israel, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain have issued a joint statement asking President-elect Joe Biden to talk to them before doing anything, really, in the region, specifically uh, re-entering the JCPOA, which... Uh, the ambassador to the United States from Israel said would be a mistake. Do you think that Biden should listen? Abe? I think that that's probably pretty good advice. It's always good to be joined with your allies and a united front, uh, especially those who are going to be most affected by this deal and who are, quite honestly, terrified of, uh, of Iran actually going nuclear. So um, I'd, uh, I'd have to say so. Uh, besides, there, I think there's, there are a lot of bad reasons uh, being thrown around for going into this, back into this deal to begin with. Um, so, but even just on its own, yes, consult with the allies. Do you think that he will, Mark? I think he will. There's no question. The one thing that Biden is is consensus builder. So there's no reason why he won't do it. I mean, keep in mind, this is pretty low on his priorities. The priority number one, number two, and number three is going to be COVID, COVID, COVID. And I think uh, worrying about Iran is going to be down there on his list, and certainly worrying about Israel in, the, in that sense is not going to be the number one thing he's going to do. But I have no doubt in my mind that he'll definitely consult. Remember, it was the Israeli government that refused to consult once a, a preliminary agreement was reached with Iran, refused to get involved in consulting about the details of that agreement. So I have no doubt that Biden will, will try to build a consensus before he does anything. And like I said before, I, only, I think he'll only rejoin an agreement if certain conditions are met. It's imperative that the Israeli government works with him and tries to help direct him towards if he's going to rejoin, rejoining with certain conditions and not fight him. I mean, that's the key. Um, the Israeli government has made too many mistakes in the last few years of fighting any democratic administration. The best thing to do is to go with it. You know, when you get stuck in a... Uh, in a, in a um, in a wave, you go with the wave, you don't fight the wave. And in this case, Israel has to learn how to go with the wave and help direct the wave in this case. And if the Israeli government fully engages the American government in this direction and fully engages the Biden administration, I think it can influence what direction it takes. Um, you know, we don't know whether Iran will agree to whatever terms that the Biden administration puts, but the reality is that's what has to happen because, first of all, the nuclear program has to stop. Remember that when Trump took office, they had... Um, what, they had uh, 105 kilograms of nuclear fuel. They now have 2.5 tons. So right, well, something has to change and has to change quickly. All right, but speaking, so speaking specifically then of the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, Iran says that they hope Biden will unconditionally return to the deal. Is that even possible, Abe? Uh, I suppose it's, it's probably technically possible. Uh, Look, the deal has sunset clauses. It, it would all expire in 2025, right around uh, right around the end of President Trump's second term. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, that's very soon. Um, and while while Biden has all kinds of ideas about what it is that he would like in the deal, the Iranians aren't stupid, and uh, they're not going to go chasing after this. It's not a really good sign that we have uh, the name Wendy Sherman is being thrown around. I mean, she was one of the negotiators of it the first time around. But keep in mind, in terms of the point uh, that Mark made just before, um, it, remember, this was, even under Obama, this was a deal that he could not get a majority of the Senate to get behind, including people from his own party. So... Uh, you know, there were a couple of, uh, of moves made legislatively, but ultimately this wasn't something like a treaty that was ratified by the Senate. So if they're going to come up with something serious, um, I, I, I don't think that Iran is going to, to agree to anything that the Senate would agree to. Mark? Well, the Senate doesn't have to agree. I mean, there are very few treaties that actually... I mean, treaties have to be ratified by the Senate, but very few international agreements have gone to the Senate for agreement in the last couple of decades because of all the rifts in the United States on, those, on these issues. But the reality is, look, we don't know what Iran will agree to. 
obviously their starting point is no changes. But that's very nice. That's their starting point. They're good negotiators. Um, and I'm sure by the Biden starting point will be, you know, 10 different changes or whatever it might be. But I believe that the bottom line, the key thing that cannot be allowed to happen is to rejoin the agreement with the current sunset clause in place. And I'm quite sure that the Biden administration understands that as well. Like I just mentioned, the sunset clause expires in five years or four, almost four and a little over four years from now. That's quite different than 10 years in the future. You know, 10 years, you can say, oh, 10 years, who knows what it'll be. But now four years in the future, we know what that little will change. So the reality is the only way that the Biden administration is going to agree to rejoin it is going to be by changing the sunset clause. And that's the biggest problem that always existed in the agreement was the fact the sunset clause was there. So I see the Biden administration pushing for that. We have to push them towards that direction. We can't fight them. We have to go with them and push them in the direction we want them to go in. And I think that's the most important thing. All right. Well, I, I want to talk now for a moment about Trump's refusal to concede uh, the, the election. How might that actually affect or even maybe embolden Iran and the Ayatollah regime in the Middle East? Uh, you know, this harkens back to the example of 9-11, actually, which uh, many experts in the United States have said was made possible because of a delayed changeover between the Clinton and the Bush administrations. Look, this is a disaster for the United States, a disaster for the world. This is undermining American democracy. And most importantly, like you said, the transition, especially in the national security field, need to take place in a smooth way. Now, look, if, if, if he concedes tomorrow morning or allows transition to start tomorrow morning, okay, a two-week delay, two delay won't be a disaster. But if this keeps on going and it keeps on pushing this and we go into December and there still hasn't been a transition, then we're really endangering the future of the United States. We're endangering any sort of agreement and weakening the United States, not to mention what it's doing to American democracy. Well, um, there's no question. Well, and what, well, and what about in the Middle thing. East? Because, uh, again, it, we're, we're here in Israel and we're going to bear any sort of effects that that, that might have. Abe, how, how do you respond? Well, clearly, well, uh, well, clearly it weakens I, us. It, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, uh, I, I don't think that... Uh, to begin with, that this undermines democracy. I think that's kind of uh, kind of silly. In fact, if the delay is being caused by lawsuits, assuming that they are meritorious to at least some degree, the uh, rule of law matters in a democracy as much as anything else. It's not just a matter of uh, of, uh, of people casting votes. Uh, there's a, a it's just a fake. Come on, enough, enough. Uh, the, the Republicans well, abroad well, need, well, need, need to be talk need to take the well, well, need to talk about of the smart. merits of the lawsuits. I don't want to talk about the merits, merits of the lawsuits. I want to talk about how right. it, how it affects America's you know persona and image in the world stage with respect to Iran's aggression in the region, especially considering the fact that you know the Ayatollah regime, uh, Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah, uh, the uh, proxy of Iran, are essentially laughing at President Trump, saying, you know, that, that he's a bully and that the whole world is against him as they always knew. Well, what they say in the, along those lines, I don't think bothers anybody very much. They can say it. They've had a, a tough few years, uh, certainly dealing with a very hardline administration. And I think there's a great deal of relief in uh, Hezbollah uh, and the Palestinian Authority and Hamas. Uh, Islamic Jihad in Iran. And uh, as far as I know, the uh, uh, general uh, feeling in, in the Israeli intel world is that Iran was working very hard to try to defeat President Trump. Um, so uh, I, I don't think they, they can make all the fun they want. I think, if anything, the people in Iran wish they could be living in, in a, 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 as democratic a state as the United States of America. All right, Mark Shulman, final comment. I don't disagree with the, the last comment for sure. Look, it weakens the United States to some extent. You know, come March, everyone will forget forget it in terms of except the Trump supporters that will still believe the election was stolen. So in terms of American security, it's not going to make any difference. It weakens the United States generally. But again, you know, come March, we'll, we'll forget that it ever happened. Hmm. Maybe we'll do a change after the who after Hoover FDR. Hoover was inaugurated in March, and people decided that was too long. So maybe we'll change it now and make the inauguration next time in December or something closer so there isn't this uh, eight, nine-week period of time of, of unknown that we've suddenly created. So All right. we'll see what happens. We certainly will. Thank you again, Abe Katzman, Mark Shulman, for joining us. Thank you. A pleasure.